Right. So thanks everyone for coming. So for this next seminar, we've got Julian DeVoist, who is a PhD student at Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology with in the group of Philip Hone, working on um, quantum reference frames, uh, in particularly in a gravitational context. So he's going to tell us today about this recent work that came out in the archive uh, one or two months ago about um, gravitational entropy and um, connection to quantum reference frames. So when you're ready, Julian, take it away. All right. Thank you for this introduction, Julian, and thanks for inviting me to this uh, seminar series to talk about my work here that came out uh, two months ago together with Stefan, Philip, and Josh. Uh, Stefan and Philip are in the audience today with me and are at OIST. Uh, Josh was at OIST and is now at Perimeter. And the goal of this talk is to convince you of the title of the, of the presentation itself. So first, maybe a little bit of history or what sparked the interest in this kind of in this um, field of research. So by well by now, it has been well known or more appreciated that if we look at the algebra of some um, space time region U and we look at the algebra of local observables, that this is a von Neumann algebra. Uh, more specifically, a von Neumann algebra is an algebra which where its bicomitant equals itself, and it naturally appears also in quantum mechanics when you look at, for example. Uh, bonded operators on some Hilbert space. Now, in QFT, it is a bit different because in, in quantum field theory, this algebra turns out to be of type 3. And I will not really go over the classification of what this exactly means, but as a consequence of being type 3, there are no well-defined density matrices for this algebra and also no well-defined trace. And in essence, it also means that there are no entropies or one can see this as actually the the reason for the UV divergence of the entropy whenever we call we calculate some entropy in a quantum field theory setting. So this was considered in a paper almost uh, two years ago by Kendra Segeral, Nongo, Pennington, and Witten, which I will abbreviate as CLPW. And there they looked at the static patch in the sitter, namely they consider some observer who travels a world line uh, along some world line gamma one. This breaks the isometry, the background isometry of the sitter to basically time, tra time translations along the world line and rotations are around it. Now, because the sitter is closed, the, the total constraints, namely the, the sitter Hamiltonian, which generates boosts along this world line and boosts uh, uh, time translations backwards in the other patch, uh, has to be considered as a gauge constraint. Now, we will be mostly um, interested in the time translations as the other isometries and technically also are gauged but they will not be important for our discussion and what comes, and they can actually kind of be taken along for the right as uh, what they consider in their paper. Now, if we consider some observer along gamma one, then their local algebra of observables, so they can probe around with their detectors, probe the quantum fields, and what they can probe is actually the full time-like uh, time -like, uh, causal development of uh, their space-like region, which in this case would be the static patch, and it is basically a result uh, from the type like time like tube theorem. So the local algebra of, obser of observables that the observer has access to is the full static patch. Now, if we want to ap apply the constraint, then, then we have to look at the gauge invariant algebra of uh, the observer. But this turns out to be just the identity element, so a trivial algebra, which is of type one. So technically you can define density matrices, but it's a bit boring because you can't really measure anything. So instead, what the CLPW considered is that they explicitly added an observer uh, to the model by uh, adding an extra Hilbert space factor, which we clock, uh, call the clock, uh, clock Hilbert space. And the constraint then becomes of the form uh, that the sitter Hamiltonian plus the clock Hamiltonian, uh, which we denote here P in their, original, in their original paper. It's actually the position with the Q, but in what comes, I will denote it P to be more in line with um, the quantum reference stream literature. Now, this has a far richer structure when we look at the gauge invariant algebra. Namely, it now consists of these operators here, which are basic, can basically be seen as relational observables, which we will talk about later, and the Hamiltonian itself, which then trans, uh, generates translations of uh, the T-label, where the T-label can be seen as like the conjugate variable to a momentum or some clock variable. Now, this algebra, uh, when we close it, so by taking a bicomitant, turns out to be isomorphic to uh, what we call the cross-product algebra. And as we will see later, this cross-product algebra can indeed be seen as the, the algebra that consists of the relational observables 
and of uh, the reorientations of what we of what we call a clock or what we uh, dress the QFT elements with. Now then it's a basic result from uh, Takisaki's, Takisaki that whenever we consider a cross-project algebra, that this will always be a type two or a type one algebra. And this immediately uh, alleviates the situation because the density matrices and the trace can be defined for type two and type one algebras. And in essence, we can uh, calculate well-defined entropies for these algebras. But this talk should, con and I hope it convinces you that what they did in the paper is actually nothing but just introducing quantum reference frames in the usual setup. So, and this is one of the main takeaways from this talk, namely the first one that the CLPW procedure is equivalent to the page Wooters approach in quantum reference frames, uh, which I'll, we will explain along the way. Now we will first look at the takeaway two and three, namely uh, that, we, that we also implement constraints which singles out a perspective neutral approach to quantum reference frames, which differs from some related works, which also came out uh, the past couple of months. And we will look at uh, bounded clocks from the start, because what CLBW does is that they look at clocks with where the spectrum is a full root line, but you can imagine that you can also consider clock Hamiltonians with a bounded spectrum. Uh, so let us first talk about quantum clocks in general and quantum reference frames. Now, in general, a quantum reference frame is basically a dynamical reference frame. So it contains some, some internal degrees of freedom, which have their own dynamics. And they're not invariant under the gauge group, such that we can dress the older, the older observables or system observables relative to this reference observables in a gauge invariant manner. Now, we will be mostly interested in the temporal gauge group, so this time translations, one dimensional, and in this case, we just call them quantum clocks. Uh, quantum clocks. So we will assume for the rest of the talk that we have some constraint for a system S and a clock C. Now the system S can be anything. Uh, it doesn't have to be a QFT. It can also be a quantum mechanical system. But in, uh, near the end of this talk, we will take it to be a type three algebra. But for now, it doesn't have to be. And then given the clock Hamiltonian, what we're after is some clock observable T that is conjugate to this clock Hamiltonian. but a non-triviality is that it turns out if that the clock spectrum is bounded, then this observable will not be self-adjoint, nor will it be monotonic, in the sense that there is some finite probability that the clock actually runs backwards. And this was already proven by Pauli and Unruh and Walt uh, way back in the day. Now, a solution to this has come out like a couple of years ago, and that's essentially to consider covariant uh, positive operator valued measures. So how do we construct these? So we can we have our clock Hamiltonian and we can just uh, take the eigenstates of this clock Hamiltonian. And then from these, we create the clock states by just integrating them with this uh, phase that depends on the energy. And these clock states will be covariant in the sense that if we take some clock state T and we uh, act on it with exponential of the clock, it will just shift the T of our clock state by the value of um, the operator, namely from T to T plus tau. And these clock states also form a resolution of the identity of our clock Hilbert space. Uh, then the operator that then will measure our time will be um, some the effect operators. So we take some Borel subset X of the real line. So this can be disconnected uh, interval of like multiple subsets. The easiest one would just be a single interval. And we define this effect operator uh, by basically integrating over this uh, cat bra. And one can then take a state, some state phi of the clock Hamiltonian, and then basically this quality here is under probability that the reading of the state, the clock reading of the state is an element of the Borel subset we're considering. And in general, this circumvents the non-triviality we mentioned on the previous slide, namely this effect operator is self adjoint and its covariance is what we call in this sense monotonic because we can just conjugate by the clock Hamiltonian and it shifts all values in our Borel subset um, by this value of tau. And in, and this circumvents uh, the non-monotonicity issue we had previously. Um, along with these effect operators, we can also define moment operators, which are just uh, these integral here, in the integrals here where we take the nth power of, um, of yeah, this t, and then we can find that if we take some commutator that we get this relation here, which if we plug in n equals one, then we exactly find our 
clock observable, which we are after. So our clock, clock observable that's conjugate to the clock Hamiltonian is just the first uh, moment operator. Uh, now, when the clock has a bounded spectrum, this adds some sort of fuzziness between the clock states. Namely, if we look at the overlap of two clock states, then we see that in the case that the spectrum is bounded from above, below, or in both directions, that we don't get that the overlap is a delta function. And so in a sense, the clocks are a bit fuzzy. There is no, uh, there's no perfect distinguishability between the different clock states. This only happens in the case when the spectrum is the full real line. And in that case, we call a clock an ideal clock because they're perfectly, perfectly distinguishable. And we also have additionally that this clock observable will be self adjoint and also that its eigenstates will be exactly uh, the clock states. So then now if we have created these clock states, now we want to start from the kinematical Hilbert space and um, apply the, impose a constraint in some way. So we start from the kinematical Hilbert space, so our system Hilbert space, then start with our clock Hilbert space, and with the full constraint, which is just, again, the sum of the two Hamiltonians. But when this acts as a constraint, this basically means that evolution in this total Hamiltonian has to be uh, taken as a gauge evolution. So, the, and this means that the time that H generates is kind of some external time, which is non-physical. And what we actually want to do is we want to use the clock to con uh, the clock Hamiltonian to create some internal time flow uh, with which we can then describe this, the rest of the system, namely, uh, namely, uh, namely the system uh, degrees of freedom. And this naturally happens in situations where we have some gravitational systems without boundary by diffeomorphism invariance and also in reparameterization invariant systems. So the goal is then to, um, to construct a physical Hilbert space where states are basically annihilated by the total constraint such that uh, when we take some exponential of this, uh, a complex exponential of H, that the state remains invariant under it. Now, in general, for a non-compact group, such as the time translations we're considering, uh, this state will be improper or not even normalizable in the usual kinematical Hilbert space sense. So then the question is, okay, how can we create a good map M that goes from the kinematical states to the physical states? And there are two ways to do this. So NCLPW, they, they use the way of core invariance, which I will not really talk about because um, we mainly use the method of refined uh, algebraic quantization, where we define this uh, pi fis, uh, coherent, which we call the coherent group averaging projector. And then on the physical Hilbert space, we define this new inner product, basically by taking these two kinematical states and acting on it with pi fis. Um, and this will be our new inner product on the physical space for which we can uh, normalize our physical states. So this pi fis is then the map M that maps kinematical states to physical states. Now we basically want to do the same with the algebra. So we want to create some, uh, to impose a constraint, we want to create some gauge invariant algebra. And we will begin by doing this first at the level of the uh, kinematical algebra. So we have the total algebra here of, of our system observables and then some bounded operating on the clock. And when we look at the algebra uh, that's gauge invariant, this consists of basically two elements. Namely in blue, we have the relational observables. Uh, so they're relational in the sense that they measure the value of A when the clock C reads tau. And this can be seen from this expression. If you ignore the integrals for a moment, then in the middle we have this conditioning on the clock state tau along with the ele element A. And this already tells us, okay, this, so this is when the clock, uh, the value of A when the clock reads tau. And then we do this uh, group averaging uh, by basically a group averaging over the full uh, group generated by both Hamiltonians to make sure that what we get here, this big O, is a gauge invariant operator. Now, the second operators in orange are done the clock reorientation. So they just shift the clocks, uh, the clock states by the, by time tau or t. And they also, you can also act with these on our blue relational observables to shift uh, the tau label here, such that we can also create observables where the value of A uh, which decodes and um, encodes the value of A when the clock C reads some other value of the time parameter. Now, if the clocks are ideal, then it turns out that you can rewrite this expression as um, basically this A dressed by uh, two exponentials. And this is, if you remember what CLPW had uh, in their paper and on a few slides back, 
So this turns out, so it turns out that this algebra is then indeed isomorphic to the cross product algebra, and this is what we meant when I said that the cross product algebra can be seen as the relational observables together with the clock reorientations. Now, when the clock is non-ideal, then in general this will not be entirely isomorphic, but it will be an isomorphic to a subalgebra of the total uh, cross product algebra. And then, since this is still on the kinematical level, in the end we define some physical representation R such that we can map our observables to observables on the physical that act on the physical Hilbert space. Now, what I did on the previous slides has all has all been at the gauge invariant level. Namely, we have some observed physical observables and we evaluate them in some physical states for different towers. And this is what we and this singles out what we call the perspective neutral approach because we're not really uh, making any reduction yet. We're at the full physical level, taking all states into account. Now, there's also another condition and also a way to implement the constraint, namely by gauge fixing. And this is basically where we condition the physical states on some uh, definite clock reading. And this is where what we call PW or the page root is approach. So if we have a physical state on the left, we can condition this on the bra, the clock state, to some uh, gauge fixed state on the right. Where this state basically uh, yeah, is just uh, there, this uh, projector, this bra applied to a physical state. And this state it basically evolves uh, via the Schrodinger equation in the system Hamiltonian. So, in this sense, it's a pers uh, perspectival or like a conditioned state, namely of, um, of yeah, our system when the clock uh, reads star again. And this um, basically maps to a sub. Uh, sub Hilbert space of our system Hilbert space by this projector C, which projects the energy eigenstage of HS on the overlap between sigmas S and minus sigma C, basically implementing the constraint. Now, since these maps are both unitaries, so you can go back by just adding on a clock state and then acting with the physical projector again. Since both of them are, both of them are unitaries, uh, the, the, inner, the pro inner products are just equal to each other. So we can just use the both and their products to normalize either state of them. Then we basically want to do the same with the algebra, namely on the left, if we start with the physical algebra, so the, just the relational observables and the clock reorientations, we can then reduce them to the right to the gauge fixed version. And then we see that these basically consist of uh, the bare system elements, A, conjugated by this uh, projector, and also the Schrodinger evolution basically with H minus HC. So this, in this case, this would just be the system Hel Hamiltonian also um, conjugated by these uh, projectors such, such that these act as the Schrodinger evolution on the states. And then one, one can note or from this paper that you essentially you can um, evaluate this relational observables in a physical state. And this is equivalent to just evaluating the bare system elements in the in the relation in the condition states in the condition states that satisfy the Schrodinger equation uh, with just HS. So then, one uh, since we since we've only taken one clock into account, we um, we can also ask the question: Okay, but what if we now have two clocks, or we want some other subset of the total uh, kinematical degrees of freedom to act as a reference? And this is in line with the recent developments of quantum frame covariance of physical properties. And this essentially is a change of description or, or gauge between uh, two different, uh, that's really just a change of description or gauge um, and both implement the constraints on the same level. So we can consider that our system is now actually has an, another clock in it. So we have our total Hilbert space, uh, kinematical Hilbert space, which is now three factors. We have our constraint, which now consists of an additional clock two. And then one can, one can, const one can construct again the total uh, gauge invariant algebra by either creating relational observables with respect to clock one together with the clock reorientations of clock one, or equivalently, we can make relational observables with clock two and then consider the clock reorientations of, uh, of the second clock as well. And this creates this triangle here. Namely, we can, uh, on the state, on the level of the states, we can start with a physical hybrid space and then reduce in either direction to the perspective level. So the page root reduction would then be one way would be with respect to clock one. Another way would be with respect to clock two. And there is a map between these two, basically the inverse of R1 um, together with R2. 
And this creates some uh, non-local unitary that maps from the left to the right. And essentially, you can, you can see this as some sort of quantum coordinate change, like on a manifold. And this is what we truly mean by that the physical Hilbert space encodes the perspective neutral, uh, perspective neutral physics in the sense that this is like our manifold that is, um, that is an intrinsic object, object. And these page Wouters reductions are like picking specific coordinates for our manifold, such that this VMAP can be seen as like some quantum coordinate change between the uh, two different ways of basically describing the same physics. Then if we have uh, this reduction or reduction in two different uh, clock reference frames or two different quantum reference frames, one can then make the, the, the one can ask this question, okay, but what's the, what's the difference then if we describe our state from with respect to one set of reference degrees of freedoms and with respect to another one? Now it turns out that in uh, the, these two papers that have exactly done this and if we have an, um, some tensor product st structure on HKIN, then it's, it's general true that the physical Hilbert space does not inherit this, uh, the same tensor, pro uh, tensor product structure. It's not even a subspace of the kinematical Hilbert space. And in general, whether there is a tensor product structure or not, or, or how you create one will depend on the quantum reference frame and its properties. So for example, if you look at this whole diagram, we can create we can look at the total algebra of cage invariant observables. So the this is like this, so this is what I would uh, previously. So we can, for example, look at the clock uh, system at clock one and dress with clock two, or we dress with clock uh, one instead. But we can also look at the two subalgebras where we only look at the system dressed with clock one and the clock one reorientations, and we don't look at clock two. And the same is uh, this would be actually C two, uh, my mistake here. But this green line would then be the system and clock two. And it turns out, for example, that if the, the spectra are different than the algebras or the physical algebras of these two um, gauge invariant subalgebras are not isomorphic to each other. And it's basically this basic tells us that um, this basically comes because the clocks will partition the system in, in different ways and will coarse grain the system degrees of freedom in different ways. So then one can also ask, okay, but what observables can then be measured in both perspectives at one, namely the overlap between the blue strip and the green strip. And it turns out that these are the algebra elements that are, are already gauge invariant from the beginning, because it can be one of the two clock reorientations because one is not encompassed in the other. So it has to be elements that are invariant under uh, clock reorientations of both clocks. And these can be equivalently written as those elements from the system, which were already gauge invariant from the start or are what we call internal to the system already. And this also carries over to the physical Hilbert space when we act with our physical representation R on this equation. So then we get to the important notion that the, no the important statement that the notion of sub subsystem and subsystem locality and all its derivatives like uh, temperature, for example, for a subsystem or whether they're in equilibrium will depend on the properties of our quantum reference frames. Uh, and it's still, in a sense, you can see this under general, as a generalization of the relativity of simultaneity, where in, in, the, in special relativity, two observers would disagree on how they partition uh, the this, this space time in space and time. And here, two observers would instead disagree on how they would uh, partition the full system and the system degrees of freedom and the reference degrees of freedom. So then, now that we had this uh, introduction to quantum reference frames and quantum clocks, let us now uh, shortly prove why the CLPW procedure is the same as what we talked about previously, namely, namely the space Hooters reduction. So let us recall the setup of CLPW, so they considered the static patch, but in their paper, they actually consider a second clock that runs backwards in time in the complementary patch on the left. Basically, because it turns out, and he also proved it in their paper, that if you have a second, uh, we also proved it in our paper more generally, that if you if there's uh, no second clock, then the the relevant algebra you're considering, namely those elements, uh, the graffiti elements dressed with respect to clock one and the clock reorientations, uh, turns out to be not a proper von Neumann algebra. And so this also means that there's no type classif classification for it, and it's unsure whether you can create that, uh, good density matrices for it. So to kind of circumvent this, you need at least uh, a second clock in our problem. So then they continue by imposing the constraint by this T-map, uh, where they first 
basically condition on clock two and then integrate over the remaining uh, the remaining uh, time translations. And then if you look at what this does to the algebra, so if you look at the gauge invariant algebra here of the dress, the relational observables of the of and region U, so in the static patch and the clock reorientations, it leaves this algebra invariant. But if you look at the complementary patch, uh, the space like separated one, then it maps this algebra to just the bare elements in this patch and the remaining Schrodinger evolution of HS plus H1. So uh, one might, might now ask the question, okay, is this not just the same as the page Hooters approach where we reduce to the to clock two? And this turns out to be true. So what CLPW considers is in their paper is they look at this algebra here, namely um, the, the, the operators in this static patch to rest with clock one, but they page would just reduce it from the second from the second clock's perspective. And you can essentially see this from here, namely that this T map on the kinematical on a kinematical state phi acts as the same as first mapping to the physical hyperspace at pi fis and then reducing with our R map to this pers pers uh, perspectival state. And you can basically kind of see this as the inverse of what they do. So they first con condition on a clock reading of clock reading two, and then they integrate over the remaining um, time translation, time the HS and H1. But instead, uh, when you write at pi fis, what we do is we first integrate over the whole group, um, the whole constraint here, and then we condition our state on uh, the clock reading, uh, reading zero, so that we get this perspectival state here. And in the end, this is just the same procedure as what uh, CLPW considers. So then the observers with clocks considered in CLPW are in fact, uh, is in fact the same as a page Wooters approach with clock quantum reference frames. And this is what we really mean by the slogan that CLPW equals uh, PW. And then one of the next points uh, we did is after this uh, proof that of the equivalence is that we want to consider multiple clocks and in general, quantum reference frame uh, covariance in this setup. So what we do, that, what we do now is we consider so, some general uh, space-time subregion U, and we assume that there are some N clocks. They can be in either patch. It doesn't really matter they are, but uh, total kinematical Hilbert space is now the system Hilbert space tensored with the tensor product of all the clock Hilbert, uh, all the clock Hilbert spaces. And the total constraint is just the sum of the system uh, system Hamiltonian together with all the clock Hamiltonians. And this is kind of a hybrid setting we're considering, namely that our system is a fully QFT, so with quantum fields and uh, gravitons in a gravitational setting, while the clocks uh, just act as quantum mechanical uh, reference frames. So then what we're interested in is that we pick some uh, subset R of the total set of all clocks, and we single out some single clock from this subset, uh, such that we can create this algebra here, which is again, then the relational observables with respect to this clock we singled out and the clock reorientations of the same clock. And now we will also want, want to consider its representation on the physical Hilbert space, on the state on the states that satisfy the constraint. And it turns out that this is uh, a type two algebra if the complement is empty and this is basically, um, so if the complement com was, empty and we get in the same situation from before by Sable W that you need to introduce an extra clock to make sure that you have a von Neumann algebra. But if, the, if there's at least one clock in the complement that's not in this subset here, then this algebra turns out to be at least of type two. So then the goal is, okay, we have this algebra, we have our physical Hubbard space and our states. So how can we define a good trace on this algebra knowing that it's a type two algebra? Um, so for this, one might first propose, okay, but what's wrong with the usual trace where we just sum over like some ba uh, some um, some basis of states? Well, it turns out that this you, that this doesn't work. That this doesn't have the properties we want of a good trace. For example, this doesn't work on our algebra we're considering because a large set of the observables uh, would not be trace class; they would just give infinity. Like if you if we would use this definition already on just our clock reorientations, you would see that you actually just get divergences. So you need some other way to create a trace. And the idea is basically to use a modular theory. So in this case, if 
if we have so in general for any algebra that's a, uh, that can even be type three, if psi is some state that's cyclic and separating for algebra, uh, with the mother operator being an identity, then we propose this as a definition of the trace, and this will already makes uh, makes um, certain that our trace will be cyclic, namely by the definition of the mother operator. If you combine this definition here with the fact that this delta psi is identity, then you just get that the trace of AB equals the trace of BA. Now, I will only give a little bit of an introduction to the model operator. If you want a better, if you want a good reference that explains it a bit more intuitively, there's this paper from last year by Source where they basically um, give it a lot of intuition to what this model operator actually does. So one of the things is that it considers thermality in the sense that if you have some finite uh, Hilbert space in quantum mechanics, that we usually call a state uh, thermal with respect to some uh, Hamiltonian K if it's of this form. And in a sense, we can see, in a sense, this model operator delta psi is a generalization of this row for also type three algebras and infinite dimensional uh, Hilbert spaces. And with this, so given this model, modular uh, operator then where K would be the modular Hamiltonian, and you can also create this flow, this kind of uh, time modular flow of any element of our of our algebra, and you would see that this just stays in the algebra. So that this, if uh, A is representing some sub, some subsystem, then conjugating by the modular operator means that you won't be mixing uh, degrees of freedom from the complement and the subsystem itself. And in the paper by source, you can uh, they actually derive it in the opposite way. So normally you would start from some arbitrary mathematical operator and then um, prove thermality by basically proving this KMS condition. But in his paper, he may, he kind of works backwards. So he starts by um, imposing the KMS condition, which basically means that psi is term, is a, should be a, seen as a thermal state. And then he um, works, uh, works backwards and say, okay, if this equation is true, then the only way for this is to be true is exactly if this time uh, dependence of A is generated by the modular flow by this modular Hamiltonian. And in the end, what's also a useful definition to create, um, to look at relative entropies is this relative modular Hamilton, uh, modular operator. Basically, uh, it's a bit similar to the, gen the, the usual modular operator, but now you also change the state from uh, phi to psi. And this will be important for when we consider density matrices. But it's a very brief, an overview of what the modular operator is a bit intuitively, but I highly recommend reading this paper if you want some uh, better explanation. So then what we now want to create is um, via this model operator, we, we want to find what we call the tracial states, namely the state that is cyclic and separating for our total algebra and our Hilbert space. And this can essentially be written as a product of three states. Namely in red, we have the usual QFT state, which would be just uh, be the vacuum of our of our Hilbert space with HS just a modular Hamiltonian. So for example, in the sitter space, this would just be the bunch Davis vac uh, vacuum state. For our single art, art clock, uh, we essentially consider this uh, kind of, uh, this very simple state where this is the t the clock equals zero state. And then for the elements of the for the other clocks, which are in our algebra, but uh, which we do not use to address any observables. We, since on those elements, you don't really find any cyclic separating state, we have to enlarge the Hilbert space to a double copy of itself. And then we need to create a tensor product of all the thermofield double states on these uh, individual clocks. And this proves to be indeed a cyclic and separating state for um, this Hilbert space and, and the algebra. So then since Psi is now a fully cyclic separating state, we can calculate its modular operator. And then it turns out the modular operator is just uh, this pi tilde, which is some projector on the tensor product of these three Hilbert spaces, which means that on that, on that sub Hilbert space, the modular operator basically acts as identity. And this is exactly what we were after, because that means that with, this al with that algebra and that Hilbert space, we can define a good trace by basically taking expectation values in this tracial state where this exponential in front is just some uh, normalization constants we will get back to on the next slide. 
So since this, since this has been at the full kinematical level, we also want to go to the physical algebra. So we consider some, we consider our physical representation R and we define a trace on the physical algebra basically by uh, this equation here. And then we want, the goal is then to find density matrices rho phi for our, some arbitrary state phi. And then by using this definition of the trace and the definition of the model operator, you can, in like a two-line argument, uh, convince yourself that the required density operator is basically this equation here, which says that our physical density matrix is just, the, is just this exponential times the physical representation of this modular operator from the tracial state to uh, the kinematical state phi, uh, to, uh, yeah, to the state phi. And we, you can play the same game on the reduced algebra, namely if we reduce the clock i and we want to create a trace there, we basically use the, the, the physical trace here and we just conjugate by uh, this page Wooters reduction map and the same holds uh, for our reduced a density matrix, we just take the physical uh, density matrix and then conjugate it by these uh, page shooters uh, reduction maps. So then um, I haven't really talked about the type yet of the algebra, so let's uh, also consider the type. So there are mainly three scenarios depending on, those, on these three subsets. Namely, uh, so remember R is the clocks we consider in the algebra where we singled out clock Ri to be the clock with which we dress our um, our other observables, and then we have some trivial supports, uh, trivial support on the other clocks and the complement. So if this, if if this, if the complement turns out to be the empty set, so we take the algebra. So this algebra here is uh, basically all the clocks, um, where we single out one clock uh, that dresses the rest. Then just like in the CLPW case, you get that this algebra is in fact not a von Neumann algebra, so you can't really define any density matrices or entropies for it. So then we have to go to the scenario that there is at least one clock uh, in the complement on which our algebra has trivial support. And then we are sure that this algebra uh, will be uh, a type two algebra, so we can create entropies, uh, so we can calculate en entropies. And then to find the exact type, uh, more specifically, we look at the trace of the identity element and basically, if if we if we take more than one clock in our subset R uh, for our algebra, then it turns out that this trace is infinite. Uh, basically, because the term of field double states we have to include are not normalizable, and we just get that our uh, that our algebra is tapped to infinity, and which additionally means that we don't have a maximal entropy state because our maximal entropy state will just have infinite entropy. While if this subset is empty, so R is just exactly one clock, then this trace, the trace of the identity can, get, can be finite only if the spectrum of that clock is at least bounded from below. And this creates a type two one algebra in which all the entropies will be finite and which uh, more specifically has a maximal, a maximal entropy state. Uh, which you usually use to normalize, uh, to set that entropy to zero so that such that all the other entropies of all the other states will be uh, smaller than zero. So talking about the entropy, uh, usually given the density matrix, it's usually a whole endeavor and very, actually very difficult to compute what the exact entropy is, mainly because this density matrix here will contain operators that don't commute with each other. So you will have to um, use some sort of BCH expansion. But there is a regime in which we have more control and we can make some approximations to have a finite result, which we will call the semi-classical regime. Namely, we have these two assumptions here. Uh, namely, that our physical state, uh, so the physical state, which is equivalent to this uh, reduced state here, is peaked around a particular orientation of the clock. Namely, that if we have our physical state and we reorient the clock, uh, clock i, beyond some certain epsilon frame, then we basically get that the two, that, that the, the result is um, that you get two uh, distingu distinguished, uh, thing, distinguishable physical states and that the overlap is basically zero. And together with the second assumption is that within this time frame epsilon is that the, the, the physical state also doesn't change too much or that it's approximately stationary. And combining these two, Essentially, you can 
interpret that the orientation of the clock, which we, which we use to dress our observables, acts as a classical time parameter for our physical states. And this is what we really mean uh, when we say this, this is a semi-classical regime. So with these assumptions, uh, there's a more controlled way of calculating the entropy. Namely, you find that the entropy is basically approximated by this expression here, where we have this an extra phi hat state, which is just the time evolved uh, state in the, reduction, in the reduced perspective of clock i. So the state here is when we reduce the physical state to clock i in the page root reduction, but it's only um, evolved in its clock degrees of freedom and not in the QFT degrees of freedom. So HS does not appear, for example, in this exponential. And then you find that this is actually a generalization of the generalized entropy considered in CLBW and the paper by Jensen et al. And in the sense that we generalize this to an arbitrary number of clocks. It, because, because you can prove that if you only consider two clocks as in the CLBW and the Jensen et al. case, you, you will find back um, their results. So that's why we call it the generalization of the generalized entropy they consider. So given these results, uh, the last takeaway I want to convince you of is that is our big claim of the talk, namely that the notion of observer dependence, uh, uh, sorry, is that the gravitation, gravitational ent entropy is observer dependence, and it is basically a realization of uh, subsystem relativity. And the story basically goes from this general observation, namely that if we pick some physical state, then we are probing the same physical state, but different observers will probe the same state uh, with different subalgebras. And what I mean is, is, so we have this triangle here, which I had some slides ago as well, is on the gauge invariant level, we have some physical state, and then we can reduce it with respect to observer one, or we can reduce it with respect to observer two, and both uh, states are unitarily uh, related by each other by this QRF transformation uh, V from one to two. However, the, the uh, the, if we look at the, observe at, the, at the gauge invariant level, what the um, elements or the operators that the observer, that observer one has access to, uh, the observer one has only access to the QFT uh, measure operators so to measure the quantum fields and clock and the own and their own clock one they're carrying, but they don't have access to clock two. So this means that if you look at this algebra, which are the relational observables are of our QFT with respect to clock one and the clock variations of clock one, this is a subalgebra of the total uh, gauge invariant algebra. So this refers back to this uh, picture we had with the gray total area and then the blue and the green strips. Now you can, so this is on the gauge invariant level, so you can reduce this by the page rootus reduction to the perspectival level. So this would be the system elements with respect to observer one. And then you can do the same for the older algebra, which is again, a subalgebra of the total uh, gauge invariant algebra. And you reduce it now with respect to uh, clock two, that it turns out because these, because on the gauge invariant level, there are subalgebras, then on the reduced level, they cannot be connected um, or they cannot be mapped into each other by this non local unitary V here. And this essentially, um, captures a whole subsystem of, rel of uh, relativity, namely that we're they are looking at the same global state, but they're probing it with different algebras, which are non-isomorphic to each other. And that's why we already expect that there would be some uh, difference in when they measure the entropy of some global state. So this entropy difference can, so can be sourced by different um, phenomena or dis different reasons. Namely, it's, a, it's apparent that if, if the clocks have different spectra, then you, would, you, would, um, you can find a difference. Um, no, you can also consider the case where observer one has a degenerate clock and observer two has a non-degenerate clock, or that the, or one of the clocks is periodic versus the other one being monotonic. Uh, or it can be that if you take a physical state and you reduce it, that in one perspective, it would be a, pro a product state, but in the other perspective, because of this non-local unitary, it will be a highly entangled state. And that is what we mean by that the states have a different entanglement structure. And to make this a bit more uh, prominent or we consider the example in which we, which we can kind of see as a gravitational interferometer, namely we consider two plus one observers. 
and we want one of the clocks to be in a superposition of two clocks. So in the perspective of observer one, we take this product state here, uh, with, where we have just some uh, physical, some states, uh, some QFT states. Then the clock, uh, clock two is then in some superposition, which you can imagine um, creating by sending some clock state around the trajectory where you put it in superposition and one of the clocks makes a flyby encounter with some massive objects, um, such that if you bring the two branches back together, that one clock is kind of like a time delayed, such, such that you get a superposition of two uh, single clock states. And then the third clock, um, G3 here, which we consider to be this extra clock for the complement, we take this to just be some uh, simple clock state uh, where, C, where we take clock three to be um, almost uh, an ideal clock. So basically meaning that its spectrum is almost fully the real line, but we still take it kind of like in sort of a limit of a, uh, the limit of a, a bounded, the infinite limit of a bounded um, spectrum. So then given the, uh, the state in observer one, we can also look at, okay, what does the state look like from, for observer two? So we essentially act with this non-local unitary. And because it's a non-local unitary, we expect that we will go from a product state to this um, to a generally entangled state because this VMAP will indeed introduce, introduce some entanglement. And that's in, indeed what we see here, namely that the, that the state from the second perspective can be written as a sum of two, uh, two essentially two product states. So the state on itself is entangled. So then one can create, uh, one can compute the density matrices for these, which we uh, explain in more detail in our paper, in our um, up upcoming paper where we explain this more in more detail. So we have the density matrix with respect to observer one, we have the density matrix to respect to observer two. And what, what's already immediately apparent is that while they have, while they're agreeably of the same form, we have this extra wave function in an energy basis um, that conjugates, conjugates this uh, model operator here in the middle and we can, so we already expect that uh, if f is not some con some constant energy wave function, that we will find some difference if we compute the entropy. So to compute the entropy, uh, we will look only at the quantum field theory parts. So for a moment, ignoring these exponentials here. Then for the first density matrix, it's pretty straightforward. We just take minus the log of this density operator. So we just get the log of this uh, projected modular operator here in the middle, and we evaluate it in the, the, the state of with respect to observer one. And then for the second um, density matrix, it's a bit more complicated because in general, this modular operator in the middle here will not commute with the modular Hamiltonian of the QFT. So you, you will have to make use of the BCH formula. And in our paper, we explain that if if we define this alpha parameter, namely delta tau, which is the offset between the two clock states, that, we, that in the superposition that we created. And if we let delta tau be very small, then we can basically expand the BC, BCH formula in a linear fashion. And then you get that um, up, so ignoring alpha squared and higher order terms, that you get a sum of these two expectation values where we have this model operator evaluated at minus star two here. And the model operated, model operated evaluated at minus star two minus delta tau, but it actually, this minus star two is a bit misleading here because if you if you um, take the expectation value in the second state, this minus star two will actually drop out. So you would you would rather see this as just phi s and phi s uh, at minus delta tau instead. And then we can immediately uh, we can extract two different sources of entropy uh, of uh, observer dependence here. Namely, the first would be exactly our different entanglement structure. Namely, this extra terms comes uh, precisely from this f and f star on both on both sides, and it this uh, essentially comes from the fact that we are dealing with an entangled state. While from the um, from the perspective of the first observer, we have a product state, and it can be re rewritten in the BCH formula, namely as the the commutator between our uh, modular Hamiltonian and the logarithm of this projected uh, modular operator. And then the second structure is that if we imagine that delta tau goes to zero so that we don't have a superposition anymore, so these Fs are constant, then you basically get the same two expressions for the entropy, 
but for one expression, you will have pi with respect to observer one here. And then for the second expression, you will have pi with respect to observer two. And this essentially means that if sigma, if the spectra of both clocks are different, namely there's a different sort of a different kind of fuzziness between the two clocks, then these projectors will coarse grain the model operator in different ways. And such that these the values for the QFT parts of the entropies will also be different. So these are like two um, examples of sources of dependence you can find, namely a different entanglement structure, a product state in one perspective, and an entangled state in another perspective, and that the properties of the clock clocks are different, namely the spectra are different between each other. So then I'll end the talk here with this last slide that summarizes all the takeaways. And I hope that I've managed to convince you of all the takeaways I've listened listed here on this slide. Uh, and I'll be yeah, I'll be ready for any questions that the audience has. And of course, I thank you for listening to this talk. So yeah, so thanks very much for that talk. Um, so yeah, if we have any questions. I'll start with, um, so uh, you mentioned throughout the talk that there were one or two other papers that did a similar approach. I assume that they didn't take this perspective neutral approach. Um, can yes. you comment a bit on the difference in the, so they reached the same conclusion about um, that connection to. Um, yeah, so they, yeah. Also, they also comment on the general connection that um, these cross product algebras, that, they, that is nothing than just implementing quantum reference frames. But uh, how they implement quantum reference, quantum reference frames is uh, different uh, from our perspective neutral one. And basically the largest difference is that they only impose a constraint on the level of the algebra, but they don't impose a constraint on the state as well. Mm -hmm. While it's well known in, in from gravitational systems and like from um, like for example, the reader derivative equation that you need to impose a constraint on the states as well. Mm -hmm. So that that's kind of different from our our case that we we impose constraints on the states and the algebra, and in their works they only um, impose a constraint on the algebra. Right. Okay. And um, and, and they don't look at entropies and observer dependence of it. Yeah. That's yeah they only consider right. yeah one clock. Right. And or two clock. and so because it's uh, implements constraints on states. Um, uh, I mean, CLPW also do that. That's why if you want to have equivalence with what Witten and so on did, then you need to go and impose constraints on states. They also impose constraints. Yeah, and that observer dependence of gravitational entropy isn't restricted to one particular approach to quantum reference frames. That would um, apply also in the other, in principle, if they if you go in that direction. Or... Yeah, I, I presume they would, but in their papers, they don't go in that direction, so... I mean, you don't even consider density matrices or like entropies like Philip mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think Anne Catherine's got a talk question. Yeah, thank you for that very clear talk. This was really helpful. Um, I have a question on whether whether you could give any intuitive reasoning for why if you don't consider the clock reorientations, you still have type three. And then by introducing specifically the clock reorientations, you get um, this isomorphism to the crossed algebra and therefore type two? Like, is there is there an intuitive explanation for that? Um, honestly, I think this is like still one of the one of the biggest questions in this in this whole field is like, okay, why why do we go from type three to type two? Like, what's the intuition behind it? Um, I don't think I can really give a satisfactory answer to why if you also in, I mean. So you need to include the clock reorientations because otherwise relational observables would of course be only at like one fixed instance of yeah. time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But why exactly what, or like what the intuitive link is, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm like not I sure. Understand, I understand that you have to include the clock reorientations to get all of the relational observables, but yeah, yeah. I find it very interesting that that's precisely what then gives rise to the type reduction, or at least it seems to me like that. Yes. Mm. Yeah, I think the whole the community is still quite unsure and divided about like what's the, what's the whole intuition behind this type three to type two conversion if we like add an extra observer and if we take uh, gravitational constraints into account. Okay. Okay. Great. So thank you very much.
All right, any further questions? Hi, right. um, I was wondering, can you apply these ideas to accelerated observers in render space as a simple set of observers where we think we know the physics? Um, well, I suppose you need to add some kind of extra degrees of freedom then that describes the observers, um, like more specific, like you need some yeah, that describe the service and that then acts on the clock. I mean, you some recent papers have done this in cosmology where they considered like the inflaton field as a clock observable. So if you want to do something sim similar in winter space, you will li likely you'd have to introduce some extra Hamiltonian as well that then will be act as the clock for your accelerating observers. I mean, uh, I guess when you, when you talk about the Rindler wedge, I mean, it's in Minkowski space, so it has some asymptotic structures. And uh, um, so you could, of course, look at perturbative quantum gravity in, around Minkowski and then look at uh, the Rindler wedges, I guess, that's what you're asking. Um, so the slight difference here with the Zitter is that um, that you know the inner space is, is spatially compact um so there's no asymptotic structure um at least not spatially which is why basically the global hamilton is directly an outright uh, constraint um but that's not quite right and or quite true in in uh when you when you do minkowski space because of the um the asymptotics you get um basically boundary contributions so the um even in perturbative gravity the um um, well, the total Hamiltonian will not just be a constraint, but it will have a bulk piece that has to vanish. And then um, there's some asymptotic pieces um, that, that are non-vanishing. Right. But those asymptotic pieces, um, you could basically use as a stand-in for an observer Hamiltonian. So um, when you have asymptotic boundaries, the, the um, boundary Hamiltonian pieces, they, they have essentially the same features as the, um, you know, the, the Hamiltonian that's um, of, of the observer here and then visitor. But what if you additionally wanted to have a bulk observer in a space like like random space next to the boundary contribution, you would also have a world line of an, yeah, yeah, of an observer. Could, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, basically the um, the construction that we've done here would also apply in that case. The only thing you have to be careful with is then, um, yeah, that you know the the total. Um, Hamiltonian um, of the system is not a constraint as boundary pieces, but it contains a, um, a bulk piece that will be um, uh, that, that has a constraint. So if you um, uh, you can rewrite it in, in such a way that basically um, you know you kind of extract the constraint piece and then you can write it as as a piece that acts on the QFTs plus. Um, uh, uh, any additional observers that you have, plus the boundary piece that you can treat as an additional observer. And then the construction of the type that we have here will apply. Okay. Thank you. Right, any more questions? If not, well, thank you again, Julian, for taking the time to give this uh, Really interesting talk. Yep. Thanks for inviting and in the audience for listening. Nice. No